Christmas. So September is Alopecia Awareness Month. And in a bit to raise a bit more awareness here in Toronto Tobago, I have two women who live with alopecia joining me on set to share their stories. Jenna Durrell and Ayn Earl, good morning and good welcome. Good morning. You. Okay, so I want you guys to start by telling me exactly what is alopecia. Okay, well alopecia is an autoimmune disease. It's where actually your immune system is fighting your hair follicles. It, it just thinks that it's a foreign object in your body and it's actually fighting it and pushing it out. There are different strains of alopecia in terms of areata, totalis and universal, universalis. So like in terms of, with Cheryl, oh sorry. Jana. In terms of Jana, you can see she has, she has hair still and there are patches with that's areata. In terms of my condition, it's universalis where I have no hair totally. In terms of everything is gone. So different strains to the autoimmune disease. Okay, so Jana, when were you first diagnosed? I was diagnosed, um, I can say between around the end of September to the beginning of October, um, but it started in July. I started to get bald spots, smooth bald spots at the back of my head in July. When I just last finished year? school. Last year? Yes, yeah, so last year, July. Um, I just finished school and we thought that it was because of stress from exam and said don't worry about it it will go back just you know stop stressing and everything will be okay and then eventually my hair started to thin out and it started to come out like I could literally pull my hair out and it would come out in my hands so we were a little bit scared we didn't understand what was going on and with some advice from one of my sisters we went to the doctor and he diagnosed me with alopecia Okay, and what were your initial thoughts and reactions? I don't know. I wasn't scared. I just was confused and like in shock because I didn't understand what was going on. It was just happening and there was no explanation. And it, I just didn't understand. And funny enough, I didn't cry when it started happening. Like, it just, I just let it happen and you know yeah and I mean, how long ago were you diagnosed and how did you deal with the diagnosis well i started to get spots 2004 mm -hmm. it started off as spots but i wasn't diagnosed until about 2005 2006 it's similar story as well in terms of the smooth spots and they thought it was stress as well too because i was dealing with a death in the family i was very close to my grandmother at the time so it was they said it was stress with that as well with exams different things as well i actually started to get it around the same age you are right now which is at 18. Mm -hmm. So it started then, 18, 19, and they diagnosed me in 2006 when they realized it started to come out in clumps. I had locks at the time and I could literally pull out a lock and see the root everything come out at the same time. So it started off first with, my, with just my head and eventually I could literally sneeze, see hair come out, rub my eyes, my lashes would come out, that sort of thing. So 2006 I think is when they diagnosed me and it just gradually became worse in a way. It was traumatic at first, seeing your hair just falling on like that and initially not even knowing why. And then understanding it too in terms of doing the research was a little better, but it was still a traumatic experience at first dealing with that. Okay, the way society has it, they tend to tie in a woman's beauty to her hair. How did, did it affect your confidence at all when you all were first diagnosed? And um, a little bit because when I when my hair started to fall out it was more at the side of my head so at first we decided to do a um a buzz cut so I like cut mm -hmm. it off I had like a mohawk and it was I was really I was a little bit sad I would say a little bit sad because the year before 2015 I just cut off my relaxed hair and I was starting to grow my hair naturally so by the time I started to lose my hair I had just started that natural hair journey and it was like all of that work to cut off the hair to start to grow it naturally for it to just start dropping out so it was it was just didn't understand <laughs> yeah okay and what has been your experience in that regard it's the same thing too because i had locks almost seven years before and was past my waist down to my hips in terms of that so it was I was always complimented on my hair and the styles and different things. So in the beginning, it was very tough for me. But even my hairdresser used to help at these two fine styles to cover the spots when they were just spots at that point in time. 
So you'd have to find different ways to cover it up. And then in between as well, so I used to wear head ties because mm -hmm. it started on the hairline as well. And I used to wear it before sometimes when I wouldn't, wouldn't twist my hair as often. So I would always have only head ties. So at least I could still cover it and feel okay. But it was a transition that was weird. Same thing as you're saying, because everybody used to look at your hair all the time. So how would they see you now? So it was kind of tough to deal with that transition. And did the hair loss affect your dating relationships? Actually, for me, it didn't. Um, when I met the person that I'm with now, I had hair. At that point, it was thinning out. But I, like, I, like she said, I was hiding it, putting my hair in style so you wouldn't see it. And when it all fell off and I showed him he, the first time, he was so supportive up to now. He's very supportive. Make sure that I take my medication and I take care of myself because he wants me to get better. Right? So it wasn't like, it didn't change with, with the person that I'm with right now. It didn't really matter what I looked like. He liked me for me. That's fantastic. And I yeah, the same thing too. Because um, my fiance actually now, he has known me without hair. So he was in school with me, with, with hair actually. He was in school with me at that time. Okay. And the first thing he, he said that always attracted me was my, was my ass to him. But he has been around for the entire time from then to now, even with other relationships and even with other people, it was never really an issue. It's at times felt weird for me, but they were all okay. So the support was always there. At what point did you all stop hiding? Stop yeah. hiding? Um, huh, when did I stop hiding? Um, there would be times that, like, usually I would, I would wear wigs or I would tie my head with scarves. And it wasn't really to hide per se, but it was like the the unnecessary attention wasn't always needed like in for example if i go to a classroom with nothing on with my bald head you know it takes attention away from the teacher and people are not going to focus so i decided to cover up my head just a little bit in certain situations so that people wouldn't be looking at me and they'd be able to focus you know but there were times that i'd say you know what i really don't feel like wearing a hat or time ahead or wearing a wig I just walk out with it just like that and I didn't care if people looked at me or came and asked me what was wrong I just be like this is the way I am you know so I can't change it and neither can you so if I accept it you have to accept <laughs> it too okay and I the first time because when it started to go I used to still wear the headscarves again mm -hmm. just avoid the questions and the stairs uh -huh. but I went to I did my masters in Barbados and even over there I still felt weird because in a foreign place now people mm -hmm. were staring even more so I think the first time that I went out somewhere mm -hmm. without a head tie or anything was 2010 I came back home for a carnival event and I went with my family and I just felt safe and since then I stopped wearing head ties but I would still wear it at work because I didn't want these stairs in meetings and different things because of my job I'll have to be out with other people all the time and meeting new people and was always extra questions that was beside the point <laughs> but about two or three years ago at my last job a day I just went to I was getting ready for work and it's like just tired of the head ties and even I think sometimes too when I was stressed the head ties used to feel tight on my head uh, mm -hmm. but it used to help as well with the AC because it used to feel cool very quickly but I just decided a day you know what just wouldn't do it and I came to look at my boss it's like you okay today <laughs> I was like yeah I'm fine and I just stopped wearing it okay, I've never worn a head tie since Okay, are there support groups for persons about alopecia here in Toronto? Not that I know of. Not that I know of either. Yeah, there was a Facebook group, but it's to me it's, in, it's inactive. I've been messaging to find out what's going on and no response. So it's actually something that I'm actually aiming to put together soon. Okay, well keep me in the loop for that. I'd for like sure. to help. And what are some of the more widely held misconceptions as it relates to persons living with alopecia? That cancer. you have cancer. <laughs> they think it's cancer. Yep. First thing they think when they see you, do you have cancer? Are you okay? Are you doing chemotherapy? And I said, no, I'm fine. I'm nothing like that. I'm going yeah. to be okay. You know, to assure them that it's not anything like that. And, you know, I feel so lucky sometimes because people ask me if I'm, I have cancer and I'm able to say, no, it's not something like that. You know, and there are people like that who have to go through that questioning every day mm -hmm. you know asking them about the situation and they have to answer them and say well 
no, I actually I'm sick and that kind of thing, I can actually say I'm okay. I'm not going through that. You know, so it's always the first thing people ask you. Do you have cancer? Are you going to be okay? And I can say, I'm fine. Nothing is wrong with me. I'm not that sick to say that something like that is going to yeah. happen, you know. And what are some of the other symptoms that you have other than hair loss? Well, because it's an autoimmune disease, you feel tiredness sometimes. It does happen to some people. Actually, too, alopecia is also a symptom actually of lupus. So people with lupus actually could get alopecia and then they also suffer the tiredness and their, their disease is even more serious than ours. But we get the tiredness for sure as one thing. And sometimes I think too, sometimes we're more susceptible for, to different diseases or different, like a f hay fever, flu is out there, we can get it. What has happened as well too, it is hereditary at times because some people, so my child could get it, but it's not guaranteed. But what they were saying when I went to one of the doctors that I went to, because I went to numerous dermatologists, uh, they said to, sometimes the diseases in your family can lead you to get this. So if there's hay fever in your family, if there's migraines in your family, eczema, psoriasis, those sorts of things. Because I have had eczema and psoriasis, actually. My mother and my father, my mother has had migraines. She has had hay fever, those sorts of things. So certain things like that could pass it along to you in terms of even as well too, because I'm slightly anemic, those things also pass it along. You know, so those things kind of lead into what could happen to your immune system then just shutting down in a way. And then seeing things in your body as foreign. And they saw the hair as foreign in my body, so they pushed it out. What would you say has been the most difficult part about living with alopecia? Um, I would say probably the, um, the constant questions of what's wrong with you. And not that I don't like answering, because I, I like giving awareness. You know, because now people have a more open mind of, Hair loss is not just cancer, right? There's other things that, and then it could also be a choice. Baldness could be a choice, you know? Mm -hmm. So you don't need to go up to somebody and ask, are you okay? Are you sick or whatever? You know, so it's just that knowing that as soon as you go outside like this, you're going to have to explain yourself or people are going to come and ask you questions, right? And sometimes it gets a little bit tiring mm -hmm. because you're in a crowd and you have people coming at you over and over. What's wrong with you? You okay? This is happening. What's wrong? And it's just like, okay, enough now. Let me just be myself, you know? So, so that would have been yeah. the stare, hard thing. The stares and the questions. But to me, in a way, because of the industry I'm involved in, because I'm involved in fashion, mm -hmm. that's why I think awareness is needed. Because a lot of people think that this is a style. Okay, okay. A lot of, even when I share sometimes now, I will share my journey and people are like, oh my God, I didn't even realize. I just thought it was a style because you're involved in fashion and it just makes sense. I was one of those people. <laughs> I, I know. So there are a lot of people out there that actually think that this is a choice and a style. And it's just really explaining it now and letting people know about it. But these stares and the questions were one of the most difficult things to deal with. And I think too, with the transition as well, seeing my hair literally just falling out was very, very tough. But yeah having lived with alopecia for such a long time do you miss your hair at all sometimes because i see some styles out there that look so good and it's like <laughs> if that was me <laughs> you know but other days it's like i can get ready so much quicker <laughs> exactly <laughs> i agree with her i would see yeah. pictures and like lately especially in school see a lot of girls with natural hair and their hair is so pretty and long and i'm like that yeah. could have been me. I could I have been there and I styles. was so enthusiastic <laughs> about growing my natural hair. So seeing them sometimes is a little bit sad because I wanted that to be me. Right? But like she said, it's so much easier to get ready now. All I have to do is wake up, get ready, put on a hat or tie my head quickly and yeah. I'm on the door. There's no and washing, no styling, no nothing. They're still styling their hair, <laughs> combing their hair and then staying up late at night to style so, so hair. Put, to I can hair. To sleep early, you know? <laughs> I don't have to worry so, about that. <laughs> you know, it, it's been, it has its ups and downs yeah. and it's goods and bad, you know? But you have to take it, take it as it is. And one thing also that I have done, I didn't do it as often as I should have, but my dad gave me some advice some years back. He said, save the money that you would spend on your hair. Ah, yeah. True. You'd be rich. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yep. And I had lots, but thankfully yeah, my, my hairdresser right. was not expensive. Oh, okay. But if I had done it every yeah. month as I used to, by now... A pretty penny. Yeah, the mm -hmm. foundation would be booming because <laughs> of the amount of years, you know? Cool. But yeah. 
Jenna, so you sing and you write. Do you ever worry that while you're performing, people wouldn't pay attention to the performance but just be distracted by the fact that you have no hair? Well, for performing lately, I have covered my head mm. because, like I said, I don't want them to be distracted by what I look like. And there was a time that my choir that I sing with in school, we went on a mission trip to sing in St. Vincent. And I wore the wig for the first half. And then after I was like, okay, this is hurting. I'm tired of this. I'm going to take it off. But I said, I can't go up there bald because then these people are not going to listen to what we're singing. They're going to be looking at this bald girl who <laughs> just had hair, you know, where did it go? So I said, I'll tie my hair because luckily I took a scarf with me. So I said, I'll tie my hair and I'll cover it up to, you know, keep people from looking. But, you know, that didn't really change anything. Okay, and what would you, if you had to give a message to a young girl living in Trinidad Tobago with alopecia, what would you say to them? You're beautiful, no matter what you look like. Yeah, it's and just hair. Having it or not, it doesn't make you a different person. Exactly. It's just hair. Did it take you a long time to get to that point though, where you actually believe that it's just hair? It did. And what was, uh, apart from these stairs, and well, luckily both of you say that you had strong support systems, but did you know when you were going through your journey, your uh, transition and phase, so mm -hmm. to speak, were you ever, did you meet someone else who had alopecia or were you the only person that you knew with the disease? I met one other person who had alopecia, but it wasn't as bad as me. She wasn't bald. She just had some patches and she had hair to cover it. So unless she showed you that she had alopecia only then you would know but me i'm bald so whether you like it or not know that something's mm -hmm. different so i'd never seen anybody who was bald like me until this morning <laughs> like when she walked in this morning i was telling my mom i wonder if she's gonna be bald like me and when she walked in i started to smile because like <laughs> now i know somebody who looks just like me Mm -hmm. So and it was really help? competent to see okay. her yeah. this morning. Mm -hmm. it, I haven't really seen much throughout my journey. Now I see people with bald hair, but I'm not, you're not sure if it's style or mm -hmm. not. Um, one of the photographers, Marlon James, when he did my first photo shoot for my business, and he showed me pictures of a guy from Jamaica who has alopecia. But they said they didn't realize that it was alopecia because it's a, it's a man, so he can be bald. Yeah. But then they realized he didn't have lashes and eyebrows. So that's how they realize. But I have never really met much people with it. I have, I've had people come up to me now and said they have family members with it though. A friend of mine actually came up and she said her daughter has it now, she's 10. Wow. So this is one of the reasons as well too is why I'm doing this because people dealing with it, people are hiding. They're not sure what they have, they're not sure how to deal. And then just for awareness because especially for a child dealing with this, you have to not just make sure she's okay but the school then knows how to deal with it. The children around know how to deal with it. Her parents know how to deal with it, you know? Because for 10 year old, I could just imagine what she's going through. Exactly. Is it that you all have to take medication constantly? I oh. don't take anything now because I was on steroids at one point. It came back at a point and it had me feeling awful. And I think even when I went to Barbados, because again, it was very expensive, mm -hmm. I was, um, I was over, over there for a couple of years because of my master's, but it was just so expensive. And to me, the treatment wasn't doing much and it just made me feel awful. So I just stopped. And since then, 2009 to now, I have not taken anything for it. What Besides my normal vitamins or anything. The steroids, what were they supposed to help with though? It's just to kind of fight to regain the regrowth. At, at one point it did help her. It grew a couple inches and then right back off. And then about a couple of years ago, I had a couple, some patches in between where I was actually seeing some hair and the eyebrows started to come back a little bit, but that was about it. And then it just went again. And it wasn't even in terms of like, I know they said it's stress induced as well. It wasn't even a stressful time. It just happened and it came and went in the same speed. But the medication is really to push to see if there is a re some sort of regrowth that can happen. I've been on Pantogar as another steroid. They've had me on Women's Rogaine to see if that could help different creams, different things, but to me, nothing works. Wow. And there is no cure. No, there so is there's no cure. Um, I started off on steroids, and like she said, it, it didn't do any more good than bad because mm -hmm. I started breaking out and started to put on a lot of weight in little time. 
So we decided to come off of the steroids for a little bit and try natural medication. And whether it was steroids or natural medication, I just don't like taking the medication because, I mean, I see it as I'm so young. Like, mm. I'm just, I just turned 18 in July. And like, for an 18-year-old who doesn't understand what's really going on with her, nobody can explain what's going on. And I have to be taking these large amounts of medication, different sorts of medication. It was tiring, especially in school. And you have to remember to take it. And I have to take it three times a day. So I remember to take it, when to take it, make sure and take it before I eat and make sure and exercise. And so many things that you had to be obligated to do. And I'm like, I just want to live my young life, you know, and not feel like I have to be obligated to do things as yet, you know? So... I mean, right now I'm on herbal medication and I try my best to take it as much as possible, (laughs) but I don't, I don't like having to take medication all the time. It's Mm. tiring and, you know. That's how I felt even with the medication. Even when we spoke before to at least her steroids with tablets, I had directly in my head injections. Excuse me? (laughs) It was directly to the spots, the affected areas, they would put injections. And how often would you have to get injections? I have to go every month. To get injections in your head. Yes, in and various how, spots. Uh, okay, so if you have just six one. spots, if you have to get six, six spots, injections. Yes, and sometimes in based on the spots, if they're very large, you get more than one injection in that spot. And how painful was that? Or they were they numb the area? In your head, so <laughs> no, no, there was a numbing, but you will still feel it, and you actually stay here, the liquid going through your mm-hmm. skull. Wow, yes. that's crazy. My mother went in with me once and never came back in. I don't believe her, sorry. <laughs> yeah. I don't she, couldn't, she couldn't deal. Yeah. And that's it. So me dealing, it's not just me, it's affecting everybody else yeah. as well. And it was just very tough dealing with that and then feeling nauseous after, feeling woozy and your head hurting you after because the numbness is gone now. So you're feeling these spots in your head that were just penetrated by a needle. So I guess at some point you realize. Yeah, it's not so when it. I got to Barbados and I was like, I have to study, I have to spend all this money to yeah. even, I have no transport again, so I have to hire a taxi because I'm not feeling well, so I can't take a, a normal bus. So, and I, the first time I did it, I felt awful after. And I called and I told my mom, I'm not doing it again. I'm not taking any medication. If this grows back, okay. If it doesn't, whatever. Okay, so John, I know you mentioned that your students at USC, mm-hmm. you live on campus. Yeah. Were you scared, wondering how your roommates would have dealt with your condition when you were just moving into the dorm? I was a little bit when I met them the first time. I, I remember having to explain to them what was wrong mm-hmm. because eventually you're living in the dorm, you can't really cover your head all, all the, the time, time yeah. right? And these girls, you're seeing them all the time almost more than your family right mm. so i mean Karen, the first time i told them that what it was and explained to them what it was they were confused and a little bit scared and one of the girls i lived with at the time um had a mother who had recently passed because she had cancer mm. so she was really emotional because she saw me and she immediately started thinking about her mother right so it was it was a little bit strange, but after that, they were very supportive and like they never tried to focus like because they all had hair. They never tried to make it like, you know, try to they tried to build the way that they were around me, which I thought was really, really good. You know, and these girls that I just met recently to be able to be so open and so nice to me, somebody that they barely knew was really, really good. So. I had really good support from the girls and then everybody else in the dorm they would see you and they'd still be nice even if they didn't understand what was going on they're still nice they were still polite nobody ever told me anything negative about the way i looked so i i didn't have to worry about that which i was very thankful for okay well amazing i'm really happy that you got that support Mm. because people could be so cruel yes okay any final words on alopecia what would you like the public to know wrap up um it's something that happens to people and it can just happen and you not understand why or where it came from but if you can find it in yourself to love yourself it shouldn't matter what you look like 
you know you should be able to stand up and say this is how I am and whether you like it or not this is how I am and I love myself so that's not gonna make me change the way I think about myself you know so you need to keep loving yourself and not caring what people think because what people think shouldn't matter to you I just want to say as I said before it's it's just here we have gone through a lot but beauty starts from inside so once you're okay with yourself you should be okay with anything else that happens to you and once you have that support system it just makes things easier and we're really trying to do more in terms of like what we're doing right now in terms of awareness to really get that support out there get that awareness out there for people so it's something that I am taking taking up the mantle in terms of that advocacy for awareness something that I really want to put more out there for and I'm really glad to have met Jenna so at least someone else and someone young too Mm -hmm. that we can start something and really support those who are dealing with it and not too sure how to deal and they're not too sure what they have even or what's the next step we are here to support if needed and it's just here and you're beautiful anyway Okay, awesome. Well, ladies, thank you so much for coming in. Thank, thank you, you for, for sharing us. your respective journeys. And I wish you all the best. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Going forward.